Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes, joined by Tim Miller, our colleague Tim Miller. Tim, I, I get more requests for when you can have Tim Miller back on, because Tim Miller is our favorite guest. So this is this is by popular demand. Oh, I'm blushing, Charlie. No, I'm blushing that. here. So anyway, if people haven't signed up for your Snapchat thing, th- this is very cool because a lot of what we do is for the olds. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't don't write me about that. But uh, Tim has a a weekly show on Snapchat, which uh, so I think your 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 median audience age is probably a little bit younger than the median <laughs> age for this podcast. I'm just, I'm just uh, yeah, just, a couple it, decades younger, I think. Just, on the just, Snapchat show. Okay, don't dig it too far. Just um, you know, just I, I had a I had a Snapchat employee message me and said that they were listening to our episode where you where you first mentioned this a couple weeks ago. They said, I'm just living for hearing you explain snapshots to Charlie Sykes on the Bulwark podcast. Uh, and uh, uh, so so they were amusing. It's great. It's called Not My Party. You just get you just download the app. You just swipe left and search for Not My Party. It seems it might seem intimidating, but it's it's doable. And it's only three minutes every week. And, um, you know, I'm hoping to this week uh, uh, give some give some hot analysis about the electoral impact of the SCOTUS pick, which we can talk about a little bit here. But it'll have a lot more funny, uh, uh, you know, sort of memes and repartee uh, on Snapchat. You can show it to your teen. And, uh, you know, it's a win for everybody. Uh, yeah. And it hasn't been shut down by the federal government yet. Right. Nope. And this is this is not one of those things that, that Donald Trump has decided to to shut down yet. We are not quite there. OK, I want to get to the takes on the Supreme Court. We have some developments as uh, as you and I are beginning this podcast. Uh, Mitt Romney. Deep sigh is siding with Mitch McConnell in moving ahead with this. So that's pretty much a done deal. If there was any question about whether or not they were going to vote uh, this year on the nomination, I think that's pretty much that's pretty much a done deal. You probably got a sense of that when Lamar Alexander rolled over. And then we heard from Corey Gardner, who basically threw himself off the parapet. He's, he's you know, not even going through the, the motion. So um, yeah. we, we did an emergency podcast on uh, Saturday, and I know you listened to that and you had different thoughts. You, you, you wanted well, to say, I guess I was, oh, well, yeah, I guess just, I was a clue. Okay. Hold it. Ahead. Just hold it because I, I had a couple of things I have to do first. Okay. Um, in, because you are a professional ad maker. You are the right. guy. Okay. You do this. I know there Ish. are more important things to talk about. I mean, I, look, I know we're hitting 200,000 coronavirus deaths. The president is out there saying it affects no one. Okay. So there's, there's that. We're getting a lot of, obviously, the Supreme Court nomination. We're getting closer to the debates. We're only 42 days out. I get all this. I am obsessed with this ad down in Georgia from Senator Kelly Leffler, who is running for re-election. She's got a more conservative challenger, and she's decided that she needs to run um, going full out Donald Trump. And she's in a very, very tough race. And this is the ad that she just put up where she's decided that she's going to compare herself to Attila the Hun, because apparently this is a primary who is the most reactionary person on the ballot or something. So Kelly Leffler's ad. Did you know Kelly Leffler was ranked the most conservative senator in America? Yep, she's more conservative than Attila the Hun. Fight China. Got it. Attack big government. Yeah. Eliminate the liberal scribes. More conservative than Attila the Hun. Uh oh. Kelly Leffler, 100% Trump voting record. I'm Kelly Leffler. I approve this message. Okay, so Tim, I just don't know. This is I love podcasts, but I just don't know if like the majesty of this medium really fully captured it because you have to see the like the like uh, D list. I mean, really like X list version of like the Geico caveman that they cast as Attila the Hun, who like looked like it was like out of a Wayne's World infomercial from 1983. I felt like that was really what captured it from a, from an ad maker's perspective. Okay, I, I get that it's probably supposed to be funny. And as I wrote in my newsletter, I said it, it's got that certain this is so bad, it's a parody of itself vibe. But I guess my main takeaway was just the pure dumbness of the thing. I mean, how stupid she must think her voters are dumb. I mean, this really does tell you what Leffler thinks that the voters want in the Trump era, that this pitch that that's both sort of, you know, kind of creepy, funny, but dim-witted and crude. And and she might not be wrong, but she's doing pretty well in the polls. Yeah, well, 
this you hit right on it charlie like the serious take on this is that it it shows where the party is and you know our friend jv jonathan v last has been all over this and like a lot of the um kind of craziness of the trump era uh is is trump down is, is top down because he's such a unique crazy figure um which i guess is the understatement of the day uh but uh, a big portion of it is is driven bottom up right like this is what the people want like you know they're just out there playing the hits and um you know what the voters want is is a candidate who's going to demonstrate they're going to be the meanest one to the media and uh, i guess if the right way to do that is to make a really bad joke about and it seems like it's a j- murder joke right i mean i guess isn't that what Eliminate the hun would have done murdered yeah, the media right. yeah so i guess right. it's a Ha ha, not really very funny joke about, yeah. about murdering the yeah. media. Uh, you know, I, I mean, that is what the voters are looking for. They're, they're not, see, look, if in two triggers, triggers the libs, LOL. Exactly. In our day, Charlie, in my golden day as a young man, back in my day in the in the aughts, yeah. you know, it, it, okay, this isn't a new thing, right? You want to be the most conservative person in the primary. But but in our candidates, it would be like a 100% record with the pro, you know, pro-life, like, right. like club for growth, endorsed, uh, you, know, gar- you know, committed to cutting spending, um, A rating from the NRA, you know, say what you want about all those things, but like they were policy oriented. They were words. Uh, they right. were yeah. they, right. they conveyed actual ideas. Right. <laughs> Even a bad see, this is the thing is it has gotten to these sort of just like grunting. scribes. It's lowest coming. So I, I get your point about, you know, top uh, up bottom up, but it's also is top down because we didn't used to have ads like this, really. And and I think part of it is is that it, the, the way that Donald Trump has made the conservative movement in the Republican Party, dumber, meaner, crueler. And, and it's it's I mean, look, look, it's the, I, I refer to it as the doltification of, of the GOP. And you have all of these copycats and clones. What I've noticed, I'm, I'm slightly obsessed about this as well, is watching commentators and not just on social media who I've watched for years and watch how their language becomes cruder simpler and by that simple i don't mean to, to praise them for clarity here but how they they really have become more, more trumpified in their language and part of it it's like they're not trying to persuade anymore it's just sort of like this mad libs of just kind of throwing out random memes and maybe it's a reflection of our politics nobody thinks that we can persuade anyone anymore so why bother just sort of do these bumper sticker bleats yeah, the idiocracy, yeah, um, yeah. you know, the dissent idiocracy. I mean, cr- I mean, just look at the Texas senators' social media accounts, you know, know, for a good example of that. And Cruz and Cornyn. I mean, maybe Cornyn was never that serious of a guy, but, you know, Cruz, like, w- initially pitched himself as this kind of constitutional <laughs> conservative, oh. right? Like, very serious. Deep thoughts. And, I mean, intelligent. Yeah, I'm from Harvard. Did I mention that? Did I mention yeah. I'm from Harvard? But no, and their Twitter feed now is just it's literally grunts and like, you know, embarrassingly bad faith, like attempts to dunk on the libs. Um, uh, yeah, no, that, you're, you're right. I mean, certainly Trump has kind of ushered this ushered this in. But um, uh, again, it's because it works. Well, it's, right? it's, it's because it's working with the base that it that 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 it's, it's spreading, right? This is this is what we've wanted all along. You were giving us policy papers. Now we want just trigger the libs. LOL. <laughs> Liberal scribes. Okay, so we're going to get to Supreme Court in a moment, but uh, I want to talk about somebody you've been working with uh, directly. You you know you uh, Olivia Troy. Yeah. You, you, I'm not mistaking that, right? Because no, 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 you're okay. not. Okay, you put together the video of her. So mm-hmm. Olivia Troy is this remarkable woman, and a growing, you know, the latest of a growing list of people uh, from the Trump administration, high-level Trump administration officials, who are now coming out and saying, "This is what we saw, and it was really terrible." And she was a top security aide for Mike Pence. What was her actual title? Do you remember? Um, she was uh, his advisor for Homeland Security, yeah. and yeah, big deal. And so yeah. we, we we had Miles, uh, we had Miles Taylor, um, we had Elizabeth Newman, who's come out. By the way, 
Um, H.R. McMaster goes on 60 Minutes and talks about the, what a danger the president is and hardly makes a ripple. I mean, we're, we're at the stage where there is, there is this pattern. But, but, but Olivia Troy uh, came out last week and, and you had an ad from uh, Republican voters against Trump that was very, very powerful. And I hope people just bear with me for a moment because she was uh, she gave an interview to NBC. And this was this morning. This this is the story about her. Uh, that was aired by NBC. Let's play Olivia, Olivia Troy. Olivia Troy is a lifelong Republican who worked at the Pentagon, was detailed to Iraq, and worked at the National Counterterrorism Center. Most recently, she was an advisor to Vice President Pence. But after eight months on the coronavirus task force, she says she had to speak out, calling it the hardest decision of her life. I felt that in my heart and in my entire being, I think American lives were continuing to be on the line. For months, Olivia Troy had a front row seat to critical decision making inside the White House, seeing firsthand what outside critics have said about the president's handling of the pandemic. He was really focused on public image, messaging, and it was really more about, you know, his personal agenda than really the agenda that the task force had at hand, which was, how are we going to save and protect Americans? She says President Trump knew in January how, how serious a threat the virus posed. We certainly had a task force meeting and discussion where we had these, just, this conversation that this was going to be big. That early, January 28th. Exactly. Late January, we knew. Yet the president was saying a week later, it's going to disappear. It's going to go away. It's going to disappear. One day, it's like a miracle. It will disappear. How did that make you feel? It was frightening. Uh, you know, when you're the president, words matter. At one meeting in the Situation Room, she says the president suggested COVID might not be such a bad thing. Did the president of the United States really say that? Absolutely. I was sitting to the right of him in the room when he said it. And he was like, and you know when you're a politician, you have to shake a lot of hands. You have to shake a lot of hands, and these people are disgusting. It's gross. And so maybe COVID, COVID's probably a good thing, right? I don't have to shake hands. I don't have to do that anymore. He said that maybe COVID's a good thing because he doesn't have to shake hands with people, with disgusting people. That's what he said. And I can't imagine how any honestly normal human being would ever say that out loud in the middle of a pandemic. She describes the scientists' frustration over the president not wearing a mask and promoting hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine? I'm taking it. Hydroxychloroquine. Right now, yeah. What was the breaking point? What made you want to speak out? I felt like I needed to tell the truth about what was happening and what we were dealing with internally, especially with the president who, you know, was very intermining of all the work that was going on in the task force. I just felt that now it mattered more than ever. Both the president and the vice president dismissing her account. It reads to me like one more disgruntled employee. I never met her to the best of my knowledge. Maybe she was in a room. I have no idea who she is. Troy says that she still respects the vice president, but thinks he was in an impossible situation. Never before in politics, she is endorsing Joe Biden, a decision made even more important after the CDC once again reversed that important guidance on the virus only just yesterday. And speaking of yesterday, of course, the, the president uh, who uh, told Bob Woodward that he'd always liked to, wanted to downplay the coronavirus, this is yesterday. Uh, keep in mind that either yesterday or today, we crossed that mile marker of 200,000 American deaths. And this occurs just at the time that we may get the fall surge. But on the day that we pass 200,000 deaths, this is what the president of the United States said. This is from the rally yesterday. Now we know it. It affects elderly people, elderly people with heart problems and other problems. If they have other problems, that's what it really affects. That's it. You know, in some states, thousands of people, nobody young below the age of 18, like nobody. They have a strong immune system. Who knows? You look at you. Take your hat off to the young because they have a hell of an immune system. But it affects 
virtually nobody. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. By the way, open your schools. Everybody open your schools. It affects virtually n- nobody. Tim Ugh. Miller. Oh, yeah. Where, where do you, Tim. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. The other thing that happened yesterday, by the way, is we passed the United Kingdom in per capita deaths, which, yeah. which uh, you know, gives us essentially besides Spain, the the worst response in the in the Western world now. I mean, some of the South American countries have had have had worse that have obviously far fewer resources um, to deal with something like this. So, um, uh, you know, that's a devastating quote. Though it affects virtually nobody. This that, that strikes yeah. me as the kind of thing that is going to be up there right with no. I don't take any responsibility for this. I mean, I yeah, I guess it would be a more devastating quote if it was just like not the same thing he says every day. I, you know, I mean, I look in that first rally in Tulsa, he was talking about how it's just the sniffles. And, you know, then Herman Cain dies. Uh, you know, like, how can you just I mean, I mean, how many more of these can can, you know, you add to the pile? I mean, it, it's clear what he's trying to do. And this is what Olivia is testifying to, and and I just, I just, I mean, obviously, I'm I'm biased here since since we were working with her, but I I want to underscore this, like this is not an easy thing for her to do, and you know, I, I think that um, she gets criticized, you know, there are people that are criticizing that are out there saying like, oh, this is you know good for your career, and you know now you can get in with the libs, and they can all give you jobs, and the media will be nice to you, and. You know, I guess, yeah, the media is probably is nicer to people who tell the truth than people who lie to them all the time. But, you know, this is not a situation like John Bolton, where she's selling a book and, and, and refusing to actually endorse Joe Biden or a situation like, you know, the mooch who's like trying to, you know, be a multi platform star. Like she's just a normal person with a normal job at a trade association. And, and you know, people with trade, you know, they don't really love it when when you're on the nightly news. Right. Um, yeah, she's uh, at a trade association. She, she's got a long way to go. She's, in yeah, early she's got 40s, a long so. career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, who knows who wins this next election? Um, you know, she had job offers to do political work in the White House. So this is, you know, you have to put yourself out there. Obviously, you have friends and family who, who are supportive, but also some who are for the president and, who, you know, kind of think you betrayed him. And so. I, you know, this is tough. And and I think it's so powerful because you can see how tough it is for her, but that she just feels compelled to tell the truth. I mean, in the video, she talks about how you know, she'd go home and it's like, how can I look myself in the mirror and think I'm making a difference when anything that we do to try to help is being undermined every day by the president? And, and so, uh, you know, I, I think this is why when you say that H.R. McMaster doesn't make a ripple, like we are getting a little inured to, uh, you know, um, important person around the president doesn't like him like no shit, you know? Um, right. and so I think that, that it can break through when you see, this is somebody who, this is like literally her dream job. I mean, this yeah. is somebody who's, who, who wanted to, to go into the government to be able to help protect the country. Like that was why she did this. And she, and, and, and she feel like she can't protect the country because the president is such a clown. And so, I, you know, um, hopefully that will, you know, have an impact with with some of these people who who, who keep getting, su- you know, who don't like him, but keep getting sucked back in and don't really trust the messengers of the media or, you know, these kind of people who look like they're trying to be famous TV pundits. Um, OK, so uh, speaking of speaking of people and we're not pivoting yeah. here of people who are being sucked back in. Um, we've talked in the past about the anti anti Trumpers, people who have recognized all of the many of the downsides of the president, been appalled by his behavior, his crudity, his lies, his narcissism, his corruption, everything. But when it comes down to it, the Democrats are always worse. But you can tell that there is a real ambivalence there. And now that we have an open Supreme Court seat and Donald Trump is poised at the five yard line to be able to put the third conservative justice on that court, solidifying conservative control, the U.S. Supreme Court for a generation. You can tell this is what they've been looking for. This this, this this, is what's going to bring them home, right? So I want to get your take because you wrote a great piece on Sunday and you've listened to the other takes we've had on this podcast. What did we get wrong? What's going on? Yeah, look, I think that, that- you're, that is right, Charlie, among kind of the pundit class, right? Yeah. Like, um, and, and I think that there's a certain class of voter who, for whom they, um, you know, th- this sort of reminds them what they like about Trump, right? They've been right. reminded 
they've been reminded a lot this year what they don't like about Trump. This is the, you know, kind of 15% of his, uh, of the people who voted for him last time that said they had an unfavorable view of him that don't like the tweets, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but here's my thing, Charlie. I, I think that those people were were coming were coming back to him anyway. Anyway. Right? Like, like anybody that, that says that this is the final straw for them was already going to vote for him. I mean, Christian Schneider, um, I think you mentioned this in the yeah. podcast with Amanda yesterday, his article is right. It's like w- once they jam this through, it's it's sort of, you know, another way to look at this for those people is like, well, what more do I need from this guy? Like I already, I already you know, I'd made my deal with the devil. I got it. And now we can dump him. But but that's not their mindset, right? Because they always were coming back around to Trump. The the thing I think that you guys have missed in the podcast over the last two days is that there's another group of Trump voter that is, um, you know, when people hear about kind of the the, the famous diner Trump voters, this yeah. the famous Obama Trump voter, mm-hmm. they, in their mind, a lot of times they think about the person that's going to the rally, the person that was out of the out of the political system and then Trump came along and they put on a red hat and like they're super fans and and those people exist. But there's another Obama Trump voter and it's just this kind of blue collar working class guy in places like Wisconsin who uh, who is pro-choice, who's for Obamacare, who's for protecting entitlements, but who is not for globalization and immigration and they hated the Clintons, you know? Right. And so that's why they came around on Trump, but they're, they've been Democrats their whole life. I, I, I don't know, Charlie, six weeks of hearing about how Trump is going to put some far right Notre Dame Catholic you know, pro-life absolutist who's going to r- get rid of Obamacare on the court. I, I think some of those people might peel off and, and, and not a ton, you know what I mean? Not a ton. But if you look at the electorate last time, he won over about, uh, I'm going from memory, I think it's 8%. I might have to get corrected on that. I think it's 8% of the electorate was Obama Trump voters. You know, if 10% of those say, I, I can't, just, this is just too far for me. I, I didn't want Ted Cruz. Like, I hate, this is why I was a Democrat in the first place, because I hated people like Ted Cruz. I thought they were weirdos. Like, Trump, to me, is a guy I saw as a business guy who probably paid for a couple of abortions in his life, right? Like, that's the Trump that they were buying on to. So he could lose some of those folks, in addition to the point I think you made rightly in, the, in both pods, which is sort of exciting the more traditional Democratic base. I, to me, it's just a loser across the board for him from the election standpoint. Obviously, there's court and a lot of other factors at play. Well, yeah. OK, so I'm trying to work through this because the, the real danger, I think, for the Democrats is that is that the left will overplay its attacks on, let's say, this Amy Coney Barrett for the moment, because I, I think it's more likely than not, unless he you know does the the, the, the Florida play, but attacking her Catholicism or Christianity, there's a long tradition of backlash to that. But the people who will be most offended about that uh, were already going to vote for Trump and right. were already motivated to vote for Trump. So I do think that that's, that's a danger, but it's probably a, a wash. The Democrats, if, if they focus, and I, I noticed this for, for at least 24, 48 hours, we're pounding away at on the health care issue that that the court it seems very, very likely uh, now to throw out the entire Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, including the protections for pre-existing conditions. And I don't know, was it Biden who made the point or so who made the point saying, you know, anybody that's got coronavirus, that is now a pre-existing condition. I thought that was actually a pretty good pivot. Uh, that's the kind of thing that I think can, uh, you know, get people's attention. You know, there are a lot of pro-life voters out there, but uh, you're probably, you know, more up to speed on this than I am. What are the numbers on repealing Roe versus Wade? What percentage of the electorate wants the court to throw Roe versus Wade out? Yeah, the, I mean, this is kind of one of those things where it uh, depends on how you ask the question, yeah. right? Um, but, um, you know, look, I mean, a total throw, a total um, um you know, putting Roe v. Wade in the garbage is a is a minority position, like whether that's kind of 60 percent or 70 percent, you know, sort of depending on how the question is asked. I mean, sure. Yeah, there are pro-life positions that are winning positions. Right. I mean, third trimester abortions are winning positions. I mean, they're winning um, uh, ways to make the pro-life argument. Sure. And, and, I, and the country is actually moving more that direction. But but just completely overturning Roe v. Wade is is not popular. Um, and, and, you know, again, the people who are passionate about overturning Roe v. Wade are pretty much already with him. Like there is a small sliver of, you know, the McMullen voter last time 
who is a single issue pro-life voter um, who, who I guess potentially he could win back. But I'm, I'm telling you, Charlie, that's a much smaller well, part of the electorate than the, than the, than the pro-choice voter who's for Trump. I mean, I, I forget where I, somebody, I think it was Nate Silver. One of these guys had it 15%. If you look at the cross tabs of Trump's voters last time said, you know, uh, said they were pro-choice, right? So like, like Trump, it's not as if Trump, you know, th- you know, doesn't have any downside risks here. Um, no, no, I and I, I think the other downside risk, which you 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 touched on, which is I think the most dramatic aspect of this story that I've seen, and I mentioned this uh, on the podcast yesterday with Amanda Carpenter. Um, I, I think the story about the money that Act Blue, the the Democratic right. political action committee, is raising, is is just staggering. So I mean, with within like the first hour, they raised you know a few million dollars. When the first three days, they'd raised a hundred million dollars. Last I looked this morning, they're saying that they raised since Friday night and this Tuesday morning right now, a hundred and twenty million dollars. I mean, that's fu money. I mean, I, I, you can say yeah. you can say that maybe money is. I, I've made the case that maybe money's you know overvalued in politics, but you know you'd rather have the hundred and twenty million dollars than not. The money is just flowing into the coffers of these Republican Senate candidates. It might Democrat. not get them over that. I'm sorry, yeah, I, the, the Democrat uh, uh, candidates. Uh, you could see uh, Lindsey Graham is in a real dogfight, and he was on Fox last night. And I don't know if you caught this, but he's asking for money. I mean, he 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 had that look like, guys, they're, they're, they're coming for me and the money is just pouring in here. So leaving the yeah. money aside for a moment, what that just tells me is just this active, you know, the, the, the base has been activated and always in an election like this. The question is, OK, Biden is leading uh, Trump among young voters by what, you know, 30, 40 points, whatever. But are young voters going to do what young voters always do, which is not vote? This is the kind of thing that is going to pull some of those progressive non-voters to the polls because we've been obsessing about the Trumpian, you know, those non-college educated whites from northwestern Wisconsin who didn't vote in 2016. Would they now, these non-voters, would they suddenly become voters for Donald Trump? And maybe there will be. But I think it's time to ask the question about whether that's happening on the left in bigger numbers. So... For yeah. sure. And I mean, like I said, I, I don't, I, I just don't see, I, I kind of agreed with Bill Crystal's column in the Bulwark about this. Like, uh, um, you know, if they jam this, especially if, you know, if you're at a 51 49 vote, and, and we, we got to talk about mid a little bit, I guess, but, you know, two weeks before the election, yes. it's going to overturn Obamacare, potentially overturn Roe v. Wade, at least in the minds of the voters, like whether or not that the votes are actually there. Uh, I mean, that is just, a, I just, that's just a loser for Donald Trump. It doesn't mean he's going to lose the election, but yeah. it just it just doesn't. This notion that it might help because there's some small sliver of anti anti Trumpers that'll go back to him, like yeah, that's true. But I just, there, it's just overwhelmed. And if you look at the Senate, Charlie, like Cory Gardner and Dead Martha man. McSally are committing Dead, seppuku Dead for yep. this seat, and that, maybe that's their choice, and maybe they think they'll get paid off on the back end as a lobbyist, or isn't, you know, I don't know how many more seats Martha McSally could get appointed to after losing multiple times, but... Um, Ambassador. Yeah, yeah, maybe they think they get something on the back end for this, but, like, it is bizarre that they aren't even faking it. I, I mean, this is, like, how weird our politics has gotten, uh, that, you know, party loyalty... And loyalty to Donald Trump is is now so great that there are literally senators who just have given up on trying to win their election. I mean, they're not even going to, you know, they're not even doing the old shtick of like, well, let me, I'm going to analyze the record of the candidate. I mean, both of them are out there saying they'll vote for whoever Donald Trump puts up uh, in purple states. Colorado is basically a blue state now, and Cory Gardner is the last statewide yeah, Republican whatever. official. Yeah. And then you got Iowa. I mean, uh, uh, the poll, the credible Seltzer poll this weekend came out showing Joni Ernst down. Um, you know, Georgia, two seats up in Georgia. I mean, I, I just, I, I don't want to, you know, get get the Democratic liberal listeners too excited here. But like, I mean, there's a real possibility of just a Senate bloodbath, and no, that's where the money does matter, I guess, more than at the presidential level. You know, you 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 mentioned the the scene of you know pushing this through fifty one forty nine um, two weeks before the election. It could be the week before the election. I mean, it, it's the, the timeline on this is just is crazy fast. 
because you're talking about if, if he if he nominates somebody on Saturday, you got what thirty nine days until the election, thirty nine days to go through the entire process. There's no way they can do that without looking like it's a rush job. The the the, the optics are going to be bad. Now, the there might be bad progressive optics if there's too much hysteria. I mean, that's I know, okay. I know I'm going to get all the blowback on all of this, but there, <laughs> there, you know, there, there's you 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 can you can overplay the hand as as well. But there are it, other it, things it, they can do though. I mean, there's still a coronavirus bill. Oh yeah. You know, well, like what they're going to not pa- they're not going to do a second relief passage to jam this through. Like that's another loser. I mean, there are. Well, well that's not a great to undermine the, the difference of the court, right? But yeah, I mean, there are a lot of political losers here. Well, that, 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 that is a great talking point, that the Senate cannot get around to doing the coronavirus relief legislation, but it can find the time to ram through this. So that that's going to be bad, certainly bad for the, the, the Senate. OK, so we have to do this. We have to talk about Mitt Romney, Mitt Romney, who... Uh, I think a lot of people had been thinking over the weekend, I certainly was one of them that was, you know, counting up votes who might want to actually not ram this through before the election. And you thought Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, Mitt Romney, and then who would be number four? But we're not even going to get to three because Mitt Romney says he's going along with it. But what's up? Yeah, I, I kind of had the sense that he was going to. I, I mean, look, Mitt, um, uh, to his credit, has done the be- has done his best during his time. He's not been perfect. But he's done his best to try to assess each situation based on the facts, right? And not get sucked into, oh, I'm a Republican, so I have to do this, or oh, I hate Trump, so I have to do that. And that that makes people unhappy at times. And when you look at this situation narrowly, and this is we can I, I wrote about this this weekend, um, for the Bulwark Plus, sign up for the Bulwark Plus. Yes, please. Uh, if you look at this narrowly, it's true, right? Like narrowly stated like the the president nominates the senate has time to advise and consent uh the republicans have the senate historically when that happens doesn't happen very often uh, may, maybe it was 1880 or whatever but like uh, but you know when one party has the presidency in the senate like the judge goes through it just it, that's just what the letter of the law is and so if you look at this through that lens narrowly you can see why mitt lands here and and that why he i think he says in his statement you know, I, I, while fairness matter, what does he actually say? He says, uh, this is not a result of a subjective test of fairness, which is in the eye of the beholder. A little bit of a cheeky statement there on that, because my argument to Mitt would be that, that the perception of fairness does matter. And because of what happened with Garland just four years ago, this distinction that, oh, because the Senate is a different party versus the Senate being held by the same party as the president means that precedent is different. I mean, you know, that's a pretty absurd and silly distinction, frankly, um, if you made the case that it was about being an election year in the past. And so, you know, to, uh, what I would have done if I was mid is get rid of that kind of kind of silly precedent distinction and just say that, look, he's he's, you know, a senator and he's going to advise and consent on judges as they come up and come down. The problem, though, Charlie, is this is that there's a real, I think, reason, justifiable reason for the Democrats and democratic voters to believe that they've been treated unfairly because they have right and so the result of that is going to be this continually spiraling you know push by both sides to take as much as they can um without having any regard for how much they should and what that what should be done for the benefit of our kind of uh, body politic and 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 mitt seemed to kind of disregard that um, which I think, frankly, is kind of in line with with what he's what he's been doing and sort of where I expected him to land, yeah, and, which will probably yeah. disappoint some of his new friends on the left. Well, this is a hard issue once you get past the procedural fairness issue, a hard issue for Republican senators to stand up against the president when it comes to a conservative Supreme Court judge. And the test that I've always had is that, you know, would they vote for this candidate if a president, Jeb Bush, um, or George Bush had named this person, or Ronald Reagan had named this person, and I think when you have somebody like Amy Coney Barrett, uh, it's conceivable. It's certainly easily uh, you, Matt, you can easily imagine that she would be appointed by some other Republican, and that there would be no opposition among Republicans. But I do think that I just want to throw this out, being a little bit contrarian, because I I know that uh, Jamie Weinstein, who does his own podcast, had an interesting tweet 
uh, last night about this, saying, look, you know, this is going to be dueling grievances here, and it, it will escalate, just like you said. And Democrats um, are, are really, you know, have real complaints about the way that Merrick Garland was uh, was treated uh, about the nuclear option for the Supreme Court. Um, all legitimate things to, to mention and the way this is going to be ran through. But remember that Republicans also have their list of, of things what they think were incredibly unfair. Um, what happened to Robert Bork, uh, the, the Clarence Thomas hearing, whatever you think of the, the merits, you know, among Republicans, they think that you know these were their grievances, that their guys were treated unfairly. The filibustering of Miguel Estrada for the D.C. Circuit Court, uh, remember, uh, you know, accusing Alito of being a bigot, you know, um, which actually caused his wife to cry. The, the filibustering of Alito um, and then, you know, Harry Reid who really set off a lot of this by ending the filibuster for other judicial nominees other than the Supreme Court. And of course, the Kavanaugh hearing, where um, still a lot of raw feelings about some of those allegations which um, against uh, Brett Kavanaugh, which we know are not true. Now, there may have been some that were true, but there were some that were just, you know, um, sh should never have been aired including all the Michael Avenatti bullshit and everything. So, you know, but bo bo both sides are, stock are, st are stocking up with their grievances. They're going to be locked and loaded going into this and then going into early next year. So my response to that, Charlie, is, well, first, uh, for, for those listeners out there that are just clamoring for more Tim, I did do two hours on the Jamie Weinstein podcast. So, you know, you can just get into a bubble bath and just, you know, listen to my dulcet tones for as long as you want if you want to, you know, click over there after this. Um, I, here's my problem with what Jamie wrote, is that it seemed to me like like comparing these lift, lists of grievances where it's like somebody came and robbed your house. And then, like, you know, when the police came, they say, well, you know, but that guy said something mean to my wife two weeks ago. And, like, I mean, you know, like, uh, the kid, his kid egged my house last Halloween. It's like, yeah, I mean, all the things on Jamie's list were were or not maybe not all the things were on were fair many of the things on jamie's list were fair grievances that republicans had with the democrats but but not on the list was stealing a supreme court seat honestly i mean and and that's what this is i mean you could argue that it wasn't stealing a supreme court seat if you were holding this norm of election year appointees don't get you know don't get advised upon but 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 literally four years later you're breaking that norm and so right. it's impossible to look at that as anything else other than the theft of a supreme court well, well I, I think about the merrick garland theft the merrick or garland the theft. Theft. Okay. yeah is, is, yeah i don't think this one is no no, no this one this one this one's not because this is look at me he, he is the president until january right, correct the, yeah Okay, the so, Merrick Garlic thing was a theft, though, and so so anyway, so if you don't mind, so this is yeah. what I wrote about this weekend. And I wanted so, to get you know, yeah, the, the yeah. twenty one year old. Yeah, so I'm uh, I'm writing a Sunday emergency newsletter for Bulwark Plus subscribers. Please subscribe, ten bucks a month. Not you know, you can do it. Um, we'll, I'll, I'm going to write it as long as I feel like we're in a national emergency, which may be until death. I don't know, we'll see, but uh, but but you know, the point I was trying to make in this was was looking at our. Democratic Republic through an eye of a 21 year old and and somebody that was born in 1999. What they see is is George W. Bush, the first president that they, you know, during their life was elected by a minority vote. Um, the the only president that they know who's been twice elected by a majority vote was denied his ability to appoint a Supreme Court nominee based on some some you know, kind of what seems to them like political bullshit, frankly, some like arcana, um, you know, not 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 a really a credible reason to deny to be denied a Supreme Court seat. Then the president they know best who you know, who, who when they were in high school, you know, came to the presidency again based on a minority vote with the help of a foreign enemy. Um encourage that help has absolutely no regard for any political norms or the rule of law was impeached for trying to get help from a foreign country again to hurt um you know his his uh to hurt his democratic opponent and then appointed a supreme court justice in the exact same way the only president that they see as fully legitimate uh was denied from doing 
just four years before. Like this is their this is when they've come of age in politics. And so, yeah, you know, look, I'm sure there are 60s kids who got disillusioned that, that saw certain things like this before. It's not this isn't unprecedented. But but when you look at this, you can understand this lack of trust. And when you add into that, you know, the the, you know, disproportionate, you know, rural bias of the Senate. When you add into that, you see things like Nate Silver say that Joe Biden needs to win by five points to be guaranteed an electoral college victory. It's easy for them to look at this and say, I get that we're a republic or whatever, but like, you know, this doesn't seem very fair. This doesn't seem very democratic. And and this seems like something that we need to change. And so I, I, just, I think that the reality is if we are not responsive to that, I think very legitimate concern, even if everything that was done was technically by the letter of the law, if it feels illegitimate and it feels unfair to a mass you know, to a broad enough part of the body politic, they're going to demand change. And if we can't demand change within the systems, within the structures, within a fair way, like we've done in the past, in a lot of different things, the Senate used to be appointed, by the way, you know, this isn't a constitutional crisis. Every time we make a change to make things more democratic, make things more fair, if we don't do it in a fair way, they're going to do it in an unfair way. And, and, and we're going to go down this drain of both parties just not really caring about our, our norms and our laws at all and just trying to own each other. And, and I'm concerned that this vote will will help continue to escalate that um, that that spiral. Well, yeah. And you point out, I mean, th- this is the question is, is, is how long can you have minority rule every once in a while? There right. might be some sort of a moment where people are willing. They may not be happy about it. But they're willing to tolerate it. But if that minority rule becomes really onerous, if there's a lot of triumphalism, if it becomes the tyranny of the uh, minority, uh, that's the problem. Um, I, one of your lines from the newsletter I thought was really sort of hit me. He says, you know, pretty much every person this 21-year-old knows is looking for a job in one of the dynamically largely democratic cities where all the growth is in this country. But most of those enclaves have minimal national political power and their vote is irrelevant. So you have this entire generation and they are told over and over and over again that, frankly, yeah, you don't really count that much. You're not going to have any count. Uh, you're, you're not going to have any, any any clout here. You're not going to be able to elect the people you want. Um, and you're watching how your irrelevancy leads to this 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 you know non-representative Senate, a president who may lose by five million votes. And at some point that is going to have an eros- a corrosive effect on support for our democratic republic and the constitution i mean th- th- that's inevitable right you, and it, especially it, when it's, the it's, people it's that not sustainable yeah and especially when the people that win based on minority vote don't act like it i mean right and i remember when i was growing up there was this thing called a mandate that we used to talk about oh, wow. right where if you won by a lot you had an electoral mandate to do a lot and Last if you won past. Yeah, yeah if you won narrowly then there, the mandate was not as great and you would like work with the other party i mean you know donald trump got fewer votes than 3 million fewer votes. And he, and he governed like he won a Reagan landslide. Right. And so did Mitch. And so, you know, I think that big fans of cocaine, Mitch listening to this podcast might think, hell yeah, good for him. Get what's yours. You never know what's coming back, but this, you know, that, that, is part of this like that arose is when they look at this and they're living and like I said look th- think of these cities they're living in Chicago New York Houston Dallas Denver Atlanta I mean not like San Francisco Los Angeles Seattle like look at the cities where Amazon was going to build their company Washington DC I mean some of these cities they literally don't literally don't have representation in Washington DC none of those people unless Georgia flips are in a state that is, has any influence on this race and so like yeah when they see that They feel like, you know, sure, the Electoral College, maybe it's a fluke once in a while. We have to represent all these smaller states. But if it's this continual drip, 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 and then the minority government that wins, you know, run, you know, puts their boot in their face. Well, and and that's going to have an impact. That goes back to the triggering the libs, LOL, where if our politics is about, you know, doing things that humiliate and anger the other side, um, that just takes that and ramps it up because, you know, it's it's one thing to be a gracious winner or a gracious loser. Um, there's there are no gracious winners and losers right now. At least the, at least in the style of government that we are seeing. Okay, two stories that I'm kind of a little bit. Um, I've I've already admitted that I'm obsessed about the the uh, Kelly Leffler thing. I, since I use that word so often, I, maybe I'm just going to be obsessed about everything through the election. <laughs> um, but um, 
this new Andrew Weissman book about the failures of the Mueller investigation. I just want to you know, put a pin in it that I think this is one of the most significant books of our era. And he was one of the top aides to Bob Mueller. And he and he documents all the ways in which basically they blew the they blew it. They, they were intimidated. They were bullied. They backed off. They didn't subpoena uh, people like Ivanka and Don Jr. Uh, when there was tremendous um, pushback from from Trump after they went after some of his financial documents, they basically said, we're not going to go after the president's finances at all. I, I, I think this book really does explain how Trump stared down that investigation, but also why he believes that he can get away with anything. It's also, I think, the first draft of history that we now are starting to get a sense of how historians are going to look back on this as, you know, in answering the question, how did Donald Trump behave this way without any consequences other than possibly losing reelection? Um, and, and, and how would, and the Mueller investigation is going to be remembered as a botch job. I just think that's the problem. But here's something I want to ask you about. Um, the, this story out of Pennsylvania, where apparently there's a possibility of a hundred thousand. Uh, just really quick on why. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I, just, I, do yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't really have a deep thought on this, yeah, except yeah. I do want to steal David from sucks. It was, you know, I get so such little joy amidst our plague and fires, Charlie, that when I get some joy, I would do like to share it yeah. from, from wrote, if curiosity killed the cat, then any cat owned by Robert Mueller can look forward to a long, full life. <laughs> <laughs> um, which i have which i appreciated the 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 Ooh. financial part of that is just um man i i just, I just think that there's going to be a uh, uh well i hopefully there will be a long period of revelation about donald trump's finances um after it was right. too late to do anything about it yeah, that that's I, I sort of fantasize about these histories in the future going, well, this was going on, this was going on. Voters didn't learn of this until after this because of these various reasons. OK, so the Pennsylvania thing, the um, the, the simple story is, is that Republicans of the, the state Supreme Court are basically taking the position that if a voter does not put their otherwise legitimate ballot into a so-called secret sleeve, inside the envelope am i getting this right that the that the ballot is thrown out so you may have a hundred thousand otherwise valid votes thrown out because of this sleeve they're called naked ballots if your ballot is naked they won't count it boy you want to talk about the nightmare scenario of this election coming down to pennsylvania and then the question of do you count those hundred thousand votes or do you not count those hundred thousand votes and that goes to the U.S. Supreme Court. And if you watch Fox News, you can tell that they're as anxious to have a Supreme Court justice to hear those election cases as they are on Roe versus Wade at the moment. Yeah, I, 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 um, I forget who I was talking to about this. One of the you know kind of good government groups um, was on a conference call, and the the just the general mail in ballot vote counting is, I think the a much bigger concern than some of the things that you hear a lot about. I just, I, I think that Trump's um, attempts to, you know, whatever stay into next year. And so, you know, some of this stuff I think is a little overwrought, but, but I do think there's a practical concern about vote counting in mail ballots, things like if they didn't sign it in the right place, you know, this Pennsylvania situation is extremely outrageous, not putting it in the envelope in the envelope. Uh, um, you know, how, what, how does a judge rule on that? Here's where the Supreme court stuff comes into play. You know, we're getting to a hanging Chad situation. Um, I, look, I, I think that, um, the Democrats would be wise to invest a lot of the money that they are getting in act in this Act Blue effort into just straight PSA campaigns yeah. about how to fill out mail ballots because I I, I think that um I am hopeful but but concerned that I will be back here on this podcast in December uh, uh, analyzing mail ballot counting procedures and um and and I think that is a well, you can't say anything's yeah. a worst case scenario anymore because every, anytime you think it's a worst case scenario, something worse happens. Um, but uh, but it's a very bad case scenario. So you and I could have had a podcast last week where we let's let's play the game, Tim. Uh, what's the worst case scenario? We would have come up with, well, what if this happens? What if this happens? OK, then there's a delay. And then at the end of it, so that's the worst case scenario. Right. And then somebody would have said, well, what if 
Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Bader Ginsburg dies. dies. <laughs> I'm sort of laughing. I mean, it's like, it's like yeah, just when you, laughter. Yeah. It, you know, just when you think it can't be you know, on your bingo card, what's the, what is the next worst yeah. thing that could happen? Or like a month ago when it was like, well, you're stuck inside in California because of the plague. What's the worst thing that can happen? How about three weeks of fires to keep you to go from going outside as well? <laughs> so you can't be outside or inside. And then maybe we'll have a hurricane thrown yeah. in there. And there's, there's always, there's always something else. But so on that bright and cheery note with just six weeks to go, I mean, is that kind of mind boggling to you that six weeks from today is election day? I'm ready. So I, was, no, we're all, we are I feel like I've aged a hundred years. I look at I look at videos from myself from I'd, in the in the Snapchat show. Fi- final plug, not my party. I, I had to put up an old clip of clip of myself being wrong from 2016, yeah. and I was like, I look like I'm 19 years old in this video. I feel like I've I'm I like a, I'm like aging right. like the lady at the end of Titanic over the last four years. So well, I'm ready. Well, Tim, here's the bad news: is that that gets worse. <laughs> oh no, Charlie, please. <laughs> As you get older, because you'll notice that. And and then you know what's going to happen. You're going to have a podcast someday and people will say, well, you know, unlike old people like you, Tim, those of us that are on, (laughs) what what will be the version of of Snapchat? It'll be an US. Yeah, that's that's right. It'll be an, an implant in your brain. Remember when you olds, Tim, would actually would watch things on a phone, you know, so this there's a certain cosmic justice. Tim Miller, thanks for joining me. I appreciate it very much. Thanks, Charlie. And thank you for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. Election Day is just six weeks from today.